Well, I've always thought a lot of the Lee family, and uh, they've always been very helpful to me, and uh, always been ready to, you know, to turn a hand to help things along when they're needed. But I never thought I would call the, one of the Lees a savior, but I'm doing that today. And the reason I'm doing that is because when I left the house this morning, I had my glasses in this pocket. They're not there now. And I've been trying, I think I've tried almost everybody's glasses in this room to see if I could come up with something I could see with. And my wife has a pair of glasses at work, but I had to go like this to be able to do it. And Kathy Lee has a pair of reading glasses that I, uh, she, she just brought in a couple minutes ago. And guess what? I can almost see what I'm doing. So I, I beg your indulgence if, they, if things don't go quite as smoothly as you thought, you know, as, as I normally would do things. But, hey, things are what they are. And uh, with God's help, I'm sure things will work out. The end, the end time things, the end time things, how are you doing? We pretty much all agree from the people I've talked with that we are in the end time. Um, how are you doing? How are you doing? Turn now to Jeremiah 23 and verse 14. Jeremiah 23, verse 16, verse 16. And I'll be using all New King James Version scriptures today. I've talked with many people over the last year or so, both inside the church and many outside of the church, who indicate that things just don't seem to be going as well as they used to. In many ways, it seems that I have felt pretty much the same way on many more occasions than have occurred in the past. One of those things would be not going as well as they used to. <laughs> A fairly recent event. In truth... In truth, that we need to stay a little closer to God in the future, in fact, a lot go closer to God in the future, more than ever before, has become more important. How far are we into the end time? How far are we into the end time? I don't know. I have no clue. But what I do know is this. Jeremiah 23 and verse 16. The Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, No evil shall come upon you. We have certainly heard a great deal of this from mainstream Christian pulpits for many years now. Verse 19. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the heads of the wicked. And I think we see some of that right now. Some of the people who are bringing these weird stuff into the American culture, some of it's coming down on their own heads. Verse 20. And the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. And I think we're starting to see that now. I think for many, many years, people have read the scriptures and they haven't been able to relate to them. But we're certainly seeing these end time prophecies come to life in our, from our experiences of watching what's going on. Turn to Ezekiel 22 and verse 1. Although I don't think that God's wrath has yet come to the near full description as to what is described in the above scriptures, 19 and 20, that I have just read. I think we're seeing things start to fit, but I think there's much more to come. Perhaps the train has just begun to pull out of the station at this point. As they say, rejecting God's Sabbath day, his annual festivals, worshiping him on Sunday, God's Sabbath day, worshiping God on pagan holidays, teaching that you can continue to sin all you want, and you will still be saved by God's grace. You can hear that today in many churches. The World Health Organization, Worldometers, estimates this. 
that the number of abortions in the world in 2020 was 42,655,202 unborn children unborn children were aborted in that year. Abortion is, according to, according to the World Health Organization, abortion is the leading cause of death in the world by all causes of death each year. Pretty sobering to think about, and I'm sure God is not pleased. This does not include the, fra the flagrant murders of every imaginable type of people who weren't aborted that now occur in this world. Even in the United States, such violence is increasing at an alarming rate, especially over the last few years. And all of this is going on while many people, even famous politicians, scream to defund the police. Ezekiel 22 and verse 1. Ezekiel 22 and verse 1. Moreover the, word, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes. Show her all her abominations. Verse 3. Then say, thus says the Lord God, the city sheds blood on her own, in her own midst, that her time may come, and she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty of the blood which you have shed, and have defiled yourself with the idols with which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near, and have come to the end of your years. Therefore I have made you, therefore I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all countries. I think that's happening to the United States over the last few decades, where in many countries the United States has become a mockery and a place that they are not happy with. Many of the other nations that I've been lucky enough to travel to, they're upset that every time the United States decides to do some screwy thing with its economy, their economy crashes, and they're not happy about that. Verse 5, These near and, those near and far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. Satan is working very hard to cause this to happen in our world right now. Stay here because we're coming back. We're coming back to this part of the Bible, so don't close your page to it. The, the political leaders of modern Israel have used their political power to shed the blood of their, the blood in their countries. They have worked to destroy the concept of the father and the mother that God created in Genesis, something that stood from early in Genesis. They are now working to destroy the concept of a father and mother. They have diligently worked to give their people both physical and especially spiritual oppression. They have oppressed the orphan and both the widow and her children. Back to verse 7, and you should be there if you didn't close your book. In you, that would be your city, your state, your country, in you, they have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger in our world today. In our world today, our government immigration policies have actually made Americans a stranger in America by bringing in cultures and expecting us to change to their culture instead of them changing to our culture. In you, they have mistreated, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. Verse 9. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. You are those who eat on the mountains. Those mountains, by the way, that they're referring to here goes back to Old Testament times when pagan temples were on the mountains. So you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst, they commit lewdness. In, their midst, in your midst, in your midst, they commit lewdness. We can certainly... We certainly can see most of all of these things in, in, you know, in public places in today's world. I mean, lewdness is, the, is, is a sign of the American culture today. 
Stay here, because again, we're coming back to this part of the scriptures. Because there is no repentance among the religious leaders in this world's churches, nor among the politicians or the people in general, the punishment of God will again intensify. We are at the beginning of problems, or near the beginning of problems. There is a satanic-inspired conspiracy that is being played out. Religious leaders and their educators have ignored or discredited the precious spiritual teachings and holy precious things that our God has made available for man's benefit through his word. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. They have taught the difference between, they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have literally turned their back on God's Sabbath day. In this age, with many, God himself has been profaned by many people and even politicians. Many, <clears throat> excuse me. Many of the rulers are like wolves, focused upon their own personal interest. God, their own personal interest. Religious leaders and prophets mouth many of their own words, saying, "Thus says the Lord." Their own thoughts, their own words, and say, "Thus says the Lord." Thus says the Lord God. So says Ezekiel 22, verses 23 through 28. You'll find that in your scriptures. In a number of U.S. cities, ruthless people have used oppression and physical force to commit robbery and have done devastating public, they have done devastating public and private property damage as a result. Then they use the justification that they're only using their legal right to demonstrate disgust for some unpopular police action or dev- or government policy, devastated police action or government policy. In the course of such behavior by mobs, many who live and work in such devastated areas have also suffered severe property damage as well as personal injuries and even death. But you don't see that in the news, but it's absolutely true. Verse 29, verse 29 of Ezekiel 22. The Lord speaking, The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy. And they they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. So he looked for someone to stand up to this stuff. And God says, I found no one. I found no one. Is that an end time scripture? I'd say so. Verse 31. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds upon their own heads. Says the Lord God. Now, we have reviewed some pretty scary stuff from the book of of Ezekiel. Has this country and this world fully reached the level of satanic-inspired badness that would, <clears throat> that would fully fulfill the conditions described in the scriptures we have just gone through. I, for one, have no idea. But for sure, our world is currently moving rapidly in the direction just described. Turn to Philippians 2 and verse 5. Philippians 2 and verse 5. As our world continues to move in the wrong direction, we very much need to stay very close to our God, the Father, and Jesus Christ as we possibly can. We need to continue to work as hard as we can to develop the very mind of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 and verse 5, a critically important scripture that we read, and we really need to take it seriously. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That should be our goal, a serious goal, not down the list of ways. That should be a primary goal, to find out how Jesus' mind worked and the character of his mind, and we should be working at adopting the same thing. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ. Psalms 91 and verse 1, we have King David speaking here. Psalms 91 and verse 1. He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, said David. He who abides in a secret place 
of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In order to, to be under the shadow of the Almighty, you have to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Where is that place? Psalms 91 and verse 1 will give us the answer. Psalms 91 and verse 1, we have David speaking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm giving you wrong information. And don't turn there because I'll read it. It's just a short verse. Where do we find the answer of God's secret place? In Psalms 119, 114. You might want to put that in your notes. Psalms 119 and verse 114. You, Lord, are my hiding place and my shield, says you, Lord, says David. You, Lord, are my hiding place and my shield. Where is God's, where is David's secret place? God's secret place? You, Lord, you are my hiding place and my shield. And you'll see the reference to Lord in the rest of the scriptures surrounding Psalms 119, 114. Now back to verse 2 of 91, Psalms 91 and verse 2. I will, say, I will say of the Lord, he is my judge and my fortress, says David. My God, in him I will trust. Skipping to verse 11 to stay in context. For he will give his angels charge over you, that their hand shall bear you up. We can all take that personally. It's speaking to you. It's speaking to each one of us personally. By staying in God's secret place, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. In the end, we win, even though we may go through some difficulties. My God in him I will trust. For In verse 11, for he will give my angels charge over you. Do you think you have angels around you? following God's direction on how to help you and how to do things that are for your spiritual good in the end. In their hands they shall bear you up. When do you need to be bared up? When you're in trouble. If you never end up with a trial, that'll never happen for you. Unfortunately, that will never happen to you. We're all having our troubles and that's going to continue. Brethren, the scriptures tell us that the future is fraught with difficulties. Now that the end time has begun, Bible prophecies tell us that some pretty scary things are going to take place at some point in the future and have already begun to take place. We have lived in the wealthiest and most powerful country that the physical world has ever seen. We are now seeing some pretty real and scary trends that are beginning to take hold in this country. Our historic culture is beginning to change from what we have personally and historically known. All of these changes are beginning to have an unnerving effect on the people's personal mindset yours and mine, and even people who are not in the church. I hear people comment about, I've never seen this kind of stuff going on before, never thought I'd see this in America. And so significantly, and to sit, it, this stuff significantly threatens to radically change our very culture, the very culture of our lives. It appears that we may be starting to lose our personal control over some important things that have in the past usually occurred in their lives in what used to be pretty normal and pretty much a predictable way. And that's changing with some important things. All of these things added to the normal ups and downs that we face in our daily lives has already and will continue to have effects on each of us that we likely have never faced before. I think that the combination of these kinds of things is what caused me to begin this message with the following statement. I'll repeat what I said when I first started this. I've talked with many people in and out of the church over these past years who indicate that things just don't seem to be going as well as they used to. In many ways, it seems to me that I have pretty much felt the same way on many, on many more occasions than have occurred in the past. In some cases, with people who seem to me to have been, who, with people who seem to me to have a positive level of significant confidence in themselves, that confidence now seems to have taken a few noticeable shots to the chest. 
Know that I am talking about people who are also very humble people. They were very confident in a very healthy way. And that confidence in some areas is starting to crack loose a little bit. Because of what we have previously covered, I am now going to change direction for the rest of this message. I wanted to set the ground for problems that you have maybe seen, for Bible prophecies that start to make sense to you in a scary way, and other things that may have caused you a problem. I'm going to change the nature of this message. This subject rests upon, this subject rests, well, let me say this. Are you personally becoming disappointed or discouraged by things? If the answer is maybe or yes, the rest of this message is definitely for you. You might title this, Disappointed, Discouraged. Do you feel that you have not had the material skills that you would like to have? Do you think that you do not have the physical blessings that you would like? Do you feel that you have made so many mistakes in your life that you cannot possibly overcome them and put your life back on track? Do you feel that you have no real talents of any kind? Do you think that no matter how hard you try, you lose every time or almost every time? Do you think that you have nothing <clears throat> do you think that you have nothing to offer anyone? Do you feel your life is empty? Do you feel that you have no hope? As Christians, do you feel that you have been a failure? Do you feel that your health is so bad that you cannot possibly overcome the handicap? If any, if any of these tend to fit your thoughts, this sermon is for you. In addition, I highly recommend that you read the book of Job. I also recommend you read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation tells us that many, many Christians who will be going through the great tribulation are clearly prophesied to be wearing white garments. You know what those are? I have often taken this scripture to be a very scary part of Revelation. That is the case, that many who go through the tribulation, a great many will be wearing white garments, because the reason that they lost their lives in the tribulation was because nothing could prevent them from staying true to our God in his ways, in the face of their own passing. They stood up to it, and they, they supported our Lord Jesus Christ and his Father and everything that they stand for. I look at that as future good news, because we know where those people are going to end up. Turn to Job 3 and verse 1. Job 3 and verse 1. Let's take a look at a person who had a real tough time with God and with the problems that God allowed him to experience. I'm not going to take the time to cover the incredibly serious trials that Job suffered. I'm going to focus on the part that shows you the stressfulness of what he went through. But take my word for it at this time. I don't... I, as far as I believe, Job, Job suffered a more serious, more serious trials for an extended period of time than any of us can even imagine. If you have ever read the book of Job, you'll find it an incredibly interesting read. And just how bad did Job have it? Job one and verse, Job three and verse one. After Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth, skipping to verse three. May the day perish on which I was born. Being in good health, he wishes that he wasn't even born. You know, may, I, may the day perish on which I was born. In the night in which, which was said, a male child is conceived. Have you ever felt that way? You ever been that down? Job 7 and verse 15, close to where you are right now so that my soul chooses strangling rather than death. He'd rather die by strangling than, you know, continue on in life. So my soul chooses strangling rather than death, rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not, I would not live forever. Let me alone, God. Have you ever said that to God? Job did. Let me alone, God. Job 9 and verse 31. 
Yet you will plunge me into a pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. Now I've had to wear some clothes that abhorred me, but vice versa? Never gave that a thought before. How about you? Job 16 and verse 12. I was at ease, but, but he, that would be God, has shattered me. He has taken me, he has taken me by the neck and, and, and shaken me to pieces. He has set me up as his target. This is Job speaking to God and about God. At times I felt neglected by God, but this? I mean, how many times have you prayed to God and asked him for all kinds of stuff and all this kind of stuff, and you hear nothing and you wonder, I wonder if he even listens. Are you the first one to have that thought? No. <laughs> Job certainly had it big time. Job 23 and verse 8. Job 23 and verse 8. Look, I go forward, but he is not there. And I go backward, and I cannot perceive him. When he works on my left hand, I cannot find him. When he turns to my right hand, I cannot see him. I've had that feeling many times. Maybe you have too. Stay right here. Stay right here while I highlight Job 32 verse 1 for you. Don't turn there. Job 32 verse 1 tells us that Job had a problem with self-righteousness. What God allowed Satan to do to Job was God's strategy to get Job's, Job's problem with self-righteousness corrected. That was the reason for it. One of the things you will learn by reading the book of Job is the amount and the seriousness of trials that God will permit someone to experience to correct even a single spiritual problem that they have. Quite amazing, because that's exactly what happened to Job. And that was God's strategy by allowing him to go through what he went through. Even while going through all of this, we know that Job clearly understood God's purpose for the trials and disciplines of, you know, to the spiritual problems that he went through. Even while go, going through all of this, we know that Job clearly understood God's purpose for trials in the disciples' lives. We know, we know that because Job said this, verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me through trials, I shall come forth as gold, spiritual gold. Blessings can also be trials, by the way. One of the things I found out in my own life, when I've been greatly blessed, I tend to give myself all the credit, and when things aren't going well, I'm saying, what happened to God? Why did you allow this? I've gotten to the point in my life, because of my reaction to such things, that when I have a significant blessing, I view it as a trial to watch myself and keep my attitude where it should be toward God. Romans 7 and verse 18, turn there. Romans 7 and verse 18. Let's shift gears and consider the Apostle Paul. In the following scripture, we have powerful, we have powerful deeply converted Apostle Paul. And according to him, he thinks he's the worst of the worst spiritually. For I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is, to present, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find, said Paul. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, said Paul, who will deliver me from this body of death? To say, to say that Paul was just a little disappointed in his performance as a Christian is at least an understatement. <laughs> I mean, he was really upset with himself spiritually. In the next verse, Paul, tell, Paul, in the next scripture, Paul, in the next scripture of Paul's that we will read, Paul was doing a little analytical analysis of God's people about two thousand years ago, or perhaps God was allowing him to see a prophecy of what modern day, the modern day twenty twenty one Church of God would look like in our world today. Carefully. Let's carefully read this verse, and you, be the, you, you decide. 
1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things of the mighty. Verse 28. And the, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And no flesh should glory in his presence. How is this going to happen? In the millennium and in the second resurrection, all these powerful, wealthy people who looked at us as nobodies, they're going to be looking at you. And they're going to see that who they thought were the foolish people of the world weren't quite as dumb as they thought they were. Let me ask you this. Do you feel that, you're, do you, feel that you are on, a, on the top of your spiritual plan? If not, after listening to the Apostle Paul's pity party, when he was really down, you now know that you are a member of a really big, really old Christian club. If you think you're not doing a good job spiritually... You're not the first person who's had that thought. <laughs> Paul certainly did. If you are having some difficult times, Jesus Christ can very much relate to your feelings, and he is more than willing to share his thoughts with you. You may get really down from time to time. You may really mess up more than you wish you had. There may be times when you crash and burn from time to time. Having said that, you are no loser. In fact, you have... You, you, in fact, you become really, when you become really discouraged and disappointed with yourself from time to time, that feeling is proof that you are on the right track. Indeed, you are recognizing your shortcomings and failures, and you are disappointed in what you're seeing, and you're going to make some corrections. You're going, you are going through the spiritual growth process that the Apostle Paul described, described regarding himself that we have just read. O oh, wretched man that I am, I just can't seem to get my spiritual act together, said Paul. Notice this reality. There is absolutely nothing in the scriptures that even come close to saying the following things. If you are not smart enough or talented enough, you cannot be saved. You're going to find that in scripture. If you have made too many mistakes, you cannot be saved. Not in the scriptures. You are condemned because you have not tried hard enough. It's the future that counts, not the past. You do not qualify for the kingdom of God because you do not have as many physical or mental talents and skills as some other people do. What counts is the process of salvation that you're going through. If you will, if you will a spirit, spiritual strength and real conversion and unshakable faith are what's key. Turn to Matthew 11 in verse 28. Every single person who has ever lived will have their chance for eternal life, except for, insert your name. Let's do that again. Every single person who has ever lived will have their chance, every single person who has ever lived will have their chance for, for eternal life, except for Neil. Put your name there. That scripture doesn't exist, or any hint of it. As, discuss, as disgusted as himself with Paul was, notice that he never hinted at the possibility that he was ready to throw in the spiritual towel. Never did that. When you start feeling that way, you know that Satan is really coming after you. He is really coming after you. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way to escape, that you will be able to bear it. Turn to Luke 22 and verse 41. God will not allow you to experience a trial beyond what you are able to endure. And if you need help, God wants you to ask him for that help. Just before Jesus was taken to be crucified, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In reading the account in Luke 22, we can, e we can easily see that Jesus was under great emotional strain to the point where he actually sweat blood. And the Father gave him additional help. 
Let's read the account. Luke 22 and verse 41. And he, was, and he was drawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him with more of God's Holy Spirit. As a physical human being, under incredible stress and strain, even Jesus Christ needed additional support to face the to face the beating that he was about to take. The father did not remove the trial from him, but he did strengthen Jesus to help him through it. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. In like manner, Paul prayed to God, asking to remove his affliction. God did not remove his affliction either. But he did give Paul enough of his Holy Spirit to help him to be able to work through the trial. Now, the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ needed additional help from the Father to face the severe trial that they were facing. Why should you feel that you are somehow different when you're facing tough stuff? Paul and Jesus Christ went through the same thing. And Jesus told Paul this, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, and your weakness is... And in your weakness too, his strength was made perfect in weakness, and so is yours when you have to depend on God. In other words, when you are weak, Paul, you are forced to rely on me instead of upon yourself. And when you are weak, you clearly see the Holy Spirit working powerfully within you. And your faith is in your faith in me, that would be God, is increased because you clearly know that you cannot do it on your own. Therefore, you rely on me and thereby are able to see the power of, of the Holy Spirit at work within you. And Paul responds to Jesus in the last half of 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 19 by saying this, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and, and, and there is none like me, declaring the, end, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. And my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure, says God. And just what is God's pleasure? Or another, another way, just why were you born? The, the, God who altered the, the God who uttered the above statements describing his infinite power uses the following scripture to describe his pleasure for you in the following statement. And each of you should take this personally because he is directing it personally to you. Don't turn there, but Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let this... Let, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, said God. We know that he is not just referring to being like him in physical appearance only, but like him in spiritual character also. How do we know that? Note that God has addressed the next scripture directly to you personally in explaining the answer to this question. Philippians 2 and verse 5. For let this mind be in you, that's you and it's me, which was also in Christ Jesus. Over time, God wants each of us to develop the very mind, the actual thought and strength of character of that of Jesus Christ. An unbelievably incredible thought. Remember that God has told you in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 that he would not let you face a trial that you could not that you could not successfully deal with with his help. God did not tell you to have Jesus' mind develop in you if it were impossible for that to happen. With God's help, that is something that you can definitely do. Turn to Luke 12 and verse 32. One of the men on the cross next to Jesus, a criminal, sincerely and deeply repented just before his death, and Jesus said to him, Today I say... You will be with me in paradise, he told that criminal. In that person's next waking moment, 
he will indeed be with Jesus Christ in paradise. Says Luke 23 in verse 43. There is no evidence that Jesus Christ had ever met this man before, except right there on the cross next to him. As discouraging as things, as, as discouraging as things may seem at times, this is scriptural proof that it is never too late. It is never too late spiritually. What a wonderful God we worship. Luke 12 and verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I've gone over a little bit, and uh, so do what you got to do. And Anyway, they didn't work too bad. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I didn't distract you too much by having to a little more difficulty looking.